Folks, we save the best for last. Um, Anand, my hero, my mentor, um, Anand changed the game in a number of fields. In data center, in mobile, in wireless, in AI, and many other things he'll talk about. So without further ado, let's give Anand a big hand. Thanks, Pankaj. I love you too. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. I was searching for a title for this talk, and I decided I was going to uh, initially titling it AI the Next Century. And then it felt limiting to actually say that, um, even though it was 100 years forward. And the reason it felt limiting to me is I think AI is actually going to be extremely pervasive and invade every aspect of our lives. So the notion of galaxy appealed a bit more to me. And uh, it also fits in with a few other themes. So hence the title, right? So I'm going to start with a little bit of a quiz. 2020, the year of the last pandemic, anybody know what the worldwide population was? Eight billion. Who agrees with him? Just raise your hand. OK, anybody say it's lower? Lower? Okay, what do you think? Okay. Okay, not that much lower. Uh, closer to 8 billion, so about 7.8, right? Okay, the time of the last pandemic, anybody know when the last pandemic was? 1918, Spanish flu, right? Anybody want to guess what the worldwide population was around that time? Shout it out, please, I can't hear it. Two billion, close to two billion. It was one point something, right? So pretty close, so about a seven X growth, seven fold growth in population over about a hundred years, right? Pretty impressive, right? To feed those 7.8 billion, uh, GDP has to grow, right? Do you agree with me? If GDP doesn't grow, productivity doesn't grow, you're not sheltering people, you're not feeding them, uh, food's not getting from one place to another, etc., right? Anybody want to guess what the GDP, worldwide GDP, was in 2020, at the time of the last pandemic? 22 trillion, okay. Do you think I need to go higher or lower? Higher, higher? okay, higher, yeah. How many, how many agree with them I have to go higher? A few. Either you guys aren't awake or you don't, don't want to vote, right? Um, how many want to go lower? Just one hand, two hands went low. It's actually higher. It's about 40 trillion, right? Um, anybody want to guess what the worldwide GDP was at the time of the Spanish flu? One trillion? Okay. 500 million? Sorry? Half a trillion. It's actually closer to a trillion. So that's actually important, right? 7x growth in population, about a 40 times growth in, uh, in GDP. If you equate GDP growth with productivity growth, tremendous growth in productivity, because without productivity, you don't get GDP growth, right? So you might be wondering, why the hell am I talking about that, right? I'm talking about that because you might have heard earlier this morning Abhijit's talk where he talked about technology is a foundational building block for productivity improvement, right? That actually is absolutely correct. These graphs I'm showing are graphs uh, that come out of a book uh, called Scale, written by Jeffrey West, who's at the uh, Santa Fe Institute. Fantastic book, by the way. If you want to look, um, instead of uh, Elamine, if you want to go to sleep, read that book. Um, but kidding aside, sorry, Meredith, great presentation. Uh, but kidding aside, fantastic book, chock full of data, right? This is what productivity technology looks like. Uh, various technologies that contributed to productivity growth over that same time frame, right? 
Um, this is the same time frame of, I'm, I'm basically talking about human history. That, that graph, previous, gra previous graph was from 10,000 years before the birth of Christ to about 2050. This is the same time frame, right? And you can see that technology has been accelerating over, uh, as we get closer to present day, very fast. In other words, breakthroughs in technology that enable breakthroughs in productivity, they've been coming very fast on the heels of the previous one. It took a long time for the first few, and then you almost have, this is a log scale, that's why it looks like a straight plummet, like a waterfall. So AI is that next technology breakthrough. And AI is, I'll talk a little bit about that, and I'm extraordinarily bullish about AI in terms of what it can do um, for a, a variety of things, right? And we're just at the very, very early, early uh, innings of AI, right? We've gone basically from prompts uh, to Project Astro, which Google just talked about at Google I.O. just recently, right? Those are baby steps, but it still feels like going from the amoeba to uh, effectively uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? So dramatic improvement, but it's still baby, baby steps, right? And so long ways still to go. Throughout history, there are three things that have really made a difference from a productivity standpoint, right? Things that improve communications improve productivity, right? Tools improve productivity, right? Wheel, um, um, printing press, tools that improve productivity, right? Third is things that improve healthcare, right? Vaccinations, right? All of those things improve productivity. The more vaccinations and healthcare, you need people to improve productivity. You need tools to enable the people. You need communications to enable those people, right? So those three things have been relatively constant throughout history in terms of things to improve productivity. So I'm gonna talk about those three things from the context of how AI impacts that, right? So the first one I'm just gonna, gonna talk about is actually communications, right? And this one is near and dear to my heart. This is actually what we do at IRA Technologies. We apply machine learning and AI to communications, right? What I'm showing here is effectively your standard base station antenna. It's being blasted with a whole bunch of zeros and ones. What we use machine learning to do in this domain is something machine learning is really good at, which is classification. So we're able to classify the base stations in terms of the locality. Is it in a suburban area? Is it in a wooded area? Is it in a concrete jungle? We can tell whether the users impacting that base station are mobile, stationary, uh, or what have you. And then we can use that information to formulate beams and other things uh, much better. And that impacts the productivity and uh, efficiency of these base stations. In fact, we've been able to demonstrate we can improve spectral efficiency by a factor of 2x. We've been able to demonstrate we can improve energy efficiency by a factor of about 25% on 4G. It gets higher when you get to 5G. And operating efficiency we can improve quite dramatically using a uh, generative AI-based solution that we've developed. So, why will all that matter? Well, today we, we are connecting about a billion people on a worldwide basis, right? Uh, people connecting to people. That number is very soon going to be trillions. And now you're looking at me saying, that's not going to be the population anytime soon, Anand. What are you smoking, right? You're correct. It's not going to be population driven. It's going to be driven by things getting connected to things, and it's going to be driven by things getting connected to people. And they're just way more things than our people because we like buying a lot of shit, right? And so that's what's gonna cause uh, these connection to go up. And if cellular operators are having trouble today connecting billions of people in an economically uh, convenient manner, they're gonna have an even harder time when they're trying to do it with trillion people, so a trillion things, trillion connections. So you need breakthroughs that are fundamental, and machine learning and AI is one of the ways to do that. The, so communications. But we're not the only ones doing this. There are a bunch of other people doing this. I'm only talking about ours because I have a lot of familiarity with what we do. Another one I want to talk about is tools, right? And here, I want to give the example of, okay. I talked about that already. Here, I want to give the example of this company called Impossible Metals. As the world gets digitized, and as the world gets electrified, right, all of those electrified things need batteries, right? Most of those batteries are, need some form of precious metals. 70% of the world's deposit of precious metals are in China. Slight problem, 
that we don't get along very well with them, right? And uh, it, they're also in other places where typically the regimes in power aren't necessarily <clears throat> regimes that our administration, either, either party side, is on great terms with. So access to precious metals is important, right? Impossible Metals has come up with a solution because there's tons of this precious metal on the seabed. Problem is it's about four or five miles down on, under, the, uh, under the ocean bed, and, or on the ocean bed, sorry, but four or five miles down uh, from the surface level. Not exactly a place a submarine can survive, not exactly a place a human can survive, so their solution is send down autonomous submersible vehicles designed to withstand the pressures under sea, but they're autonomous. So they can guide themselves in the ocean bed, they can collect the materials and bring it back up to the surface, deposit it, and ultimately uh, solving one of our problems. So fantastic company, early stages, they've been able to demonstrate the submersibility of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, machines that they've had off the coast of Florida. They've been able to go take it down a couple of miles and over, over time they're gonna take it down further. And it's also using the, the AI basically so they don't clean up the ocean bed. They leave some deposits in place because those deposits are gonna collect more. It's like crystallization. They're gonna collect more. So it's a very intelligent solution, very cool, and I wanted to show that because this is one of the ways that AI is improving tools that we need for the future, right? The other example I wanted to give is in the case of health. And this one, this one is a company called Evozyne, and Evozyne is using machine learning and AI, AI in this case, uh, generative AI to be more specific, to effectively discover uh, synthetic molecules. And the domain space that they have to search to come up with these synthetic molecules is just huge. Uh, talking to the co-founder, who's a professor from the University of Chicago, uh, he said there are more synthetic molecules you can actually discover than there are stars in the solar system. Um, I'm going to take his words for that, for that, right? That's just a very, very large domain space, right? So they use evolution rules to train uh, their generative AI model, which they've built together with NVIDIA, to search for molecules that have higher efficacy. And they're able to do these, uh, discover these molecules in a repeatable manner in a 12-month period, right? Fascinating and basically improves productivity of discovery of these uh, proteins uh, that can be efficacious from a therapeutic standpoint. So very fundamental health. So I talked about three things that AI can have a pretty significant impact on. Um, uh, communications, tools, and health. There's tons more happening. I just wanted to touch on these three things, right? So, final comment I will leave you with is this one. Anybody know what that is? Yep, exactly. That's a picture taken by Voyager 1 as it's leaving our solar system. Um, and those of you that are uh, Carl Sagan fans, right? Um, I think uh, 1990 is when, or 1994 maybe, is when this picture was actually taken. And Sagan referred to this in his uh, TV show as, this is where we live. This is where everybody we love lives. This little speck of dirt in the entire universe, right? Um, and, and then he ended that particular show with saying, if you're in astronomy, it's an incredibly humbling uh, domain to be uh, practicing uh, your art because you, you realize how insignificant you are. Uh, now, those of you that are in AI and work in AI, I'll actually say the same thing. If you're working in AI, it's an extraordinarily humbling experience. You think you know a lot and then you realize you don't know shit because the world is changing so fast, right? And I work in that domain and I, I think I am an AI expert, but I shudder to say that word because I know as soon as I say that, I'll know there is at least 100 people who know a hell of a lot more than I do, right? Um, I say that all from the standpoint of we are just scratching the surface, right? And I want to put this in the larger context as well. Again, this is where we live. And that entire time frame that I talked about where I showed population growth, productivity growth, that was 10,000 years before the birth of Christ to 2050, right? That's tens of thousands of years, right? Uh, human history is, if you count it all together, or living organisms, a couple of hundred thousand years, right? Max. The Earth has been before, there for a few hundred million years, right? And it's still got several hundred million years more to go, right? So mankind is at its very, 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 very early stage, just like AI is at, at its very early stage. 
We need tools of productivity that can keep GDP rates growing so that we can feed our population, we care our population, et cetera. AI is that next tool, and it's going to be extraordinarily pervasive. Um, so I, for one, I'm very bullish on where this goes, and it's going to impact everything in our lives. Thanks for listening. Thank you.